Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I'm delighted again to be able to host the September Macro Investing Masterclass with three distinguished capital markets experts, namely Chris Watling, CEO at um, Longview Economics, Edmund Shing, CIO at BMP Parabell Wealth Management, and Patrick Armstrong, uh, CIO at um, Plumini Wealth. So welcome, gents. Hi there. Good morning. Having us. Yeah, morning. well, um, a lot's been happening since uh, we last spoke, and there's a ton of key macro and economic information coming out um, later this week, not least tomorrow's Federal Reserve interest rate decision alongside the UK CPI. And then I think later in the week, we also have decisions by the Bank of England and the uh, Bank of Japan. So maybe we can start there, Chris. I've really been scratching my head. Where are we? on the economic cycle. You have these sort of experts saying we're late cycle, but actually most people now have written off a recession after 15 years since the last one. So where where are we? What's your latest thoughts? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny, you're right. The the Wall Street uh, wizards, as they call them, have changed from recession call earlier this year to soft landing. That's now the consensus uh, that uh, it's all been licked and all been beaten. I, you know, the good news is I think inflation is beaten, basically, and, and we can stop hiking rates. So if you really think about what drives inflation, whether it's monetary or inflation expectations, or some people talk about the labour market, I think all the forward looking indicators of that say whatever your inflation view as to the driver, it's licked. So that's the good news. Uh, but the bad news is I'm afraid there's over tightening. And if you look around the world, there's so much evidence of it. You have a damaged Chinese economy. You have a very damaged European economy that's probably in recession now. I was just in Northern Europe in the last couple of weeks, and every country I went to is the same story. Construction's dead. No one's borrowing any money. Money's too tight. There's no buyers of commercial resi, et cetera. And then then even in the States where it's there's an odd bright spot but in reality i think it's it looking tough and we're working our way towards recession and the labor market is starting to go so you know we are late cycle the stock market is behaving as if we're late cycle and um you know i think it's pretty clear so yes inflation's licked and beaten great news uh bad news i'm afraid is the recession is coming and then, um, Patrick, if if, uh, if Chris is right and we are late cycle, is the stock market really showing us that it is? I mean, you've got the US at sort of like a P ratio of roughly about 19 forward, but obviously the UK and Europe are very, very under, seem very undervalued compared to historical norms. What's sort of your latest view in the terms of equities going for? Because the, the stock market and the economy are obviously two different things. So I'm not bearish on equities. I think equities are pretty fairly priced. They're expensive in the US, driven by the multiples the mega cap techs are trading at. They're cheap in Europe and Japan, but for good reason. I think um, the US, you can make a case for a soft landing, um, plausible to call it Goldilocks. In Europe, it's anything but Goldilocks. So uh, you've got almost no growth in Europe. In the US, it's growing probably this year at close to potential at 2%. Um, inflation is on the downward trend in the U.S., but the weak euro, the high oil prices, inflation might prove to be a little bit stickier in Europe. So uh, you've got maybe uh, the stagflation in Europe, even where inflation just continues if the ECB can't hike anymore because of a weak economy. But the weak euro, the higher commodity prices, you may have a bit more persistent inflation in Europe, despite a weak demand backdrop. Um, in our multi-asset portfolios, the traditional ones, My cautious strategy, I've got 31% equities right now versus a 35 neutral. In our balance, we're at 46 equities versus a 50 neutral. So I've not made big moves, but I've moved slightly underweight equities in these strategies. So, so Patrick, if if you're suddenly like less than 40% into equities, (laughs) where are you putting all your money? Is it bonds and cash? Well, you know, my cautious strategy, 65% neutral would be in bonds. And it's mostly in bonds. Short duration bank bonds, I think, are almost a risk-free way to get a, a 6% yield. A JP Morgan bond, two-year duration, you get a 6% yield on. And there's no scenario JP Morgan's going to default on their senior bonds in the next two years. So um, the yield curve entices you to the front end, just with the shape of it, the inversion. Um, bank debt bonds from double A rated banks are giving you higher yields than triple B industrials just because people have seen what's happened to Credit Suisse 2008 still in their minds. But uh, that's a nice yield pickup where you're going to beat inflation with a 6% handsomely. And I've actually added duration recently, but not through conventional bonds, but through tips. Um, A real yield on a 10-year tip 
is 2% right now. And I think that's attractive. I agree with Chris that inflation is definitely on a downward trajectory. You, you probably even starting to see some demand slow down. But populism is still the winning policy in governments. And if there's any trouble, it's cutting taxes, spend more, and eventually that's going to lead to a monetization strategy. That's why I want the inflation protection in my duration. So I lock in 2% on whatever inflation is. If there's no inflation, I get a 2% real return. If there is inflation, I'm hedged against that. So uh, I'm skewed between tips at the long end and short duration banks at the at the front end. Wow, well, that certainly sounds um, you know a pretty sort of well, it's a well balanced uh, sort of little portfolio. Mm. Now, now, Edmund, what's your, what's your sort of lady view? I know you've been relatively more optimistic in terms mm. of the future, but are, are you sort of like seeing the alternative now in fixed income as well, rather than equities? Uh, and we the- have done, for, yeah, absolutely, Paul. We have done for some time. I think, yeah, we're very much with Patrick there. Um, our struggle is to get our clients to move into bonds at all because they're very happy with cash yields. I mean, look, it depends where you're coming from. What is your expectation? What are you happy with? If you're happy with 4 or 5%, yeah, you know, 4% in Europe, 5% in the US, well, why would you do anything other than cash? Because you can get achieve 5% plus in money market funds and dollars. Uh, you can achieve uh, you know, close enough to 4% on a term deposit or something similar in euros. And of course, in pounds, yeah, you're under 5% again. You know, there are money market funds that can give you close to 5%. So, uh, and I notice national savings and investments, the, the UK government offer a one year fixed rate at 6.2% for those of you who are brave enough to go with them online. My parents, unfortunately, you know, it's a struggle. As soon as I said the word online, they said, no, not doing that. But for those of you who are not technophobes, 6.2% from the government. Well, I mean, why would I buy government guilt for a year when I can have 6.2% from the government via their online site? So, I mean, yeah. I can't. I can't imagine there'd be many people not that not that unhappy with six point two percent at the moment. And so, so Chris, just coming full circle, why is the to say the US on a sort of like a nineteen twenty times PE? The UK is on I don't know eleven or sort of like ten or eleven, and Europe's probably on twelve or thirteen. Why? Why the big discrepancy in valuations, and also why it has had so many flows into US equities? If you do have now this alternative of bonds of over five percent. Well, um, of course, really, there's seven stocks that dominate the US market cap. So the magnificent seven uh, that um, Patrick was talking about earlier account for actually about a seventh of the world's entire stock market capitalization. And uh, there are even more of the US capitalization. I mean, the US is sort of 60, 65 percent of of global market cap at the moment. So these seven stocks are valued on very high PE ratios. So, I mean, in general, on average, over time, if you look over history, the US PE ratio is about three uh, PE points higher than the UK anyway, because it's a better run. A lot of the companies are better run. They've got higher returns on equities. But really, it's the dominance of, of tech, and, and that's what's been driving the flows. And, and actually, it's another reason we're, we, we look late cycle. I mean, when the retail guys get heavily involved in trading stocks, that's generally generally assign your late cycle. And, and I think that that's where we're at at the moment. I think what's most fascinating about those Magnificent Seven is NVIDIA is, of course, a terrific company. I don't follow companies, as you know, but we all know it's a terrific company. It's discovered a new terrific chip uh, that it that it, in last November that it launched in, in, in terms of AI, and that drove the stock higher. But on its earnings announcement a few weeks ago, the stock gapped up on the announcement. They were blowout earnings, absolutely fantastic, way above the really high expectations. And then the stock promptly sold off for the next few weeks. And it's down something between 10 and 15% from, from that earnings announcement. So that is telling you that everyone's bought it, that the whole world's in, you know, everyone's all in. And, and I think that's the theme with US equities as well. Name me someone on the planet who doesn't know about the Magnificent Seven. There ain't no one, there's no one. I mean, I think even my grandmother, if she were alive, would tell me about NVIDIA today. Um, so, you know, it's like Charlie Munger said, you know, price is um, what you pay, value is what you get. And um, these stocks are very expensive and they become fashionable. And when a stock becomes fashionable, it generally tells you that it's sort of time is almost up. So in terms of leadership of the market, not in terms of being a good company. So that's why the US is expensive. The amount of tech in the UK market, I think it's sub 1% of the market cap. The amount of tech in Europe is not dissimilar to that number. So it's to do with the sector weightings and, and so on. 
Yeah, well, I, I think you're right on um, Nvidia. It is a sort of the poster child, it's the Yul Brynner, isn't it, of the um, of the of the Magnificent yeah. Seven? If you remember the film or the, the whatever it is. Now, now, Patrick, yeah. how are you treating tech? Because I do, you've obviously been cautious in terms of which you've selected, but uh, you've done pretty well out of it. I'm not. Uh, are you in Nvidia or even ARM, or are you are you sort of like going towards your Microsoft and your Googles? So I own Google, I own Apple, um, I don't own NVIDIA or Tesla or Meta this year, unfortunately. They're all up 150 to 200%. For clients who come to me who really want to own um, big cap growth, which you can understand why they want to, what I've been doing is telling them sell puts right now. And you can get paid a 12% yield while you wait. If the market comes back to you, you own stocks you want it to own anyway at discounted value. So NVIDIA is at 430. We've been selling nine months put options on it at 330. And you're doing this across the range, it's yielding about 12% for the strategy because you pick up 5% from free from the, the treasury, sell about 6% in premiums on these great stocks where the only real issue is the multiple they trade at. So you're mitigating the really expensive multiples. You're getting paid a premium to do it if the market runs away from you. You're not going to be too upset because you've collected that 12%. If the market comes back, these are stocks you want to own anyway, and you've done it cheaper than where they're trading, and you've picked up the premium. So I think that's a nice way to play expensive companies. It mitigates the valuations, and it's not the business models. It's not the economy the worry with these companies. It really is the multiple. Mm. How are you uh, playing uh, tech, uh, Edmund? Because obviously, with your AI hat on, <laughs> you've got a better, you've got a really good detailed insight into well, uh, what's yes, been driving but... the the sort of the stellar performance. Yeah, but Paul, I I, I would exactly echo what uh, Chris said about um, glamour stocks. You know, and the academic research is very clear on this. Glamour stocks do get overvalued, and when the retail investors piling into these glamour stocks, that's when the smart money should be exiting. Uh, I exited too early, <laughs> have to be honest. We have been cautious on US large cap tech for, for most of this year. So we have missed, you know, you could argue we've missed a lot of the run up. But again, if you just bear in mind a, a slightly longer span of performance, everyone's so focused on this year to date since January. But if you include 2022 and say, okay, from the beginning of 2022, how have stocks done? Well, the NASDAQ is down 11%. Okay over the over the two mm. over the one and a bit years nearly two years so yeah it, it looks great this year but it looked horrible last year and again we have to get, keep that in mind as well that how many people were smart enough to avoid have avoided it all of last year and then bought it on the first of january this year not mm. so many i would wager yeah so it looks spectacular and and as patrick said there have been spectacular gains in some of these stocks uh, glamour stocks but i would be incredibly nervous now and our advice is similar to Patrick's. It's really to look elsewhere or to use structured products, not just to buy these stocks on a naked basis at these very high valuations. Because, yeah, you know, there's a lot of expected growth priced in at these very high valuations today. And, and the risk of disappointment is correspondingly re relatively high. Yeah, I think you all raise brilliant points there, particularly in terms of the you know the, the the big mega cap tech. Because if you had Nvidia blowing the numbers out and uh, it, it it you know exceeding expectations, and its share prices fall, that says mm. to me that they've reached a sort of a fairly you know stretched levels. And I also, I think I guess the AI play will actually have, the rubble will have to hit the road. It's probably sometime next year or late this year. That's going to start generating some some actual results because it's all been multiple expansion. Well, exactly. And, uh, exactly. Where's the money? You know, yeah. Where, show us. Uh, there will be a show us the money moment for AI, mm. like with any in, any mega trend. And I think yeah. maybe the smart way Paul to play that would rather be to look at sectors that will benefit from AI as opposed to the NVIDIAs of this world, these so-called enablers, because we're not quite sure who the real long-term winners are going to be. But we can be pretty sure, for instance, that the healthcare sector is going to benefit enormously from innovation and diagnostics in new treatments and finding new drug candidates from the applications of AI. So you could sort yeah. of play it that way, in, as I said, instead of buying the NVIDIAs of this world. Yeah. Now I'm just switching to something, uh, Chris. In terms of sort of like you know, just just broadly in terms of commodities and and China, how are you seeing that sort of like ecosystem playing out? Because we've really got a bit of a slowdown in the first half, which nobody expected in in China. But now they do seem to be sort of like thinking about stimulating. Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, I mean, the thing about China is it's it's clearly got a, a, a bursting housing bubble. 
and you know and and the conversation about how important housing is to china has been going on for several years and and the estimates that are sensible are it's about 30 percent of gdp direct or indirectly affected by um by what goes on in real estate so when you burst a bubble you you can't just sort of throw bits and pieces of stimulus at it that's kind of what they've done in the last few um weeks you've had a bit of cuts to mortgage rates you've you had some cuts to uh, the rrr last week there's there are bits and pieces but they haven't really come out with a big bazooka and and i think what you need in china is you really need a big policy bazooka uh to offset this this confidence that's crashed in the economy as a as a result of housing and if you think about it there's all this cash in bank accounts but the people who have cash in bank accounts in china are the people who own houses and and they're also the people whose kids are unemployed youth unemployment is at sort of record 21 percent uh, they stopped publishing it now because they're so uncomfortable with the number <laughs> uh which actually if you look at the number of stats they stopped publishing in china it's, it's frightening it's sort of halved in the last few years so 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 the, the, the china is a real issue um, and and actually i think this is really interesting because people people say is is the west going to export inflation to china as i said i think inflation is largely licked in the west anyway or is china going to export deflation to the rest of the world and i think we're much more likely to get the latter one and if they don't have a big policy bazooka what's really interesting about china is where's the release valve and the obvious release valve is the currency and of course if their currency does weaken significantly i know they're trying to defend it but if it does weaken significantly then of course you export a lot of deflation to the west so it's really really important for the whole western story and it's also very important of course for china but yeah i think china's got some real real challenges here and um i just i just don't i just doesn't seem like they want to do a big a big policy response and that's the key question that you got to ask yourself and think about mm. and in that absence um uh, patrick of a big sort of like bazooka etc in china what's your sort of your view of sort of commodities and and, and mining stocks and likewise big oil because uh you know, the, the oil price is, is steadily ticking up above 90 and people are getting worried that whether that's going to have knock on effects into um, into inflation. How, how are you sort of playing this area? Because the, the valuations are extremely low if you look at historical prices, but it's that E. Where's the E going to be going forward? Yeah, coming into the fourth quarter, healthcare and energy were my preferred equity sectors. And it's because year to date, they were up pretty much zero while the market's up 15 percent. And there's going to be an extra million barrels of oil consumed by the time we get to February versus where we are now every single day um, with pretty subdued economic growth, but with growth coming out of China that's way below what people forecast, but still aggregate growth. Um, the a energy intensity in Asia, it's outstripping growth in the Western world. It's going to be more demand. There's more consumption. Um, and production is pretty much cap, except uh, for OPEC. So OPEC's got to get rid of the cuts to meet the growing demand or they let prices rise. So I'm not sure that energy prices are going to rise from here, but I do think they can stay at elevated levels, which is incredibly powerful backdrop for oil and gas companies that buy back shares, pay dividends, pay down debt. And they've been ignored this year um, because everyone's been worried about this recession that's just around the corner. And I, I do think just the share buybacks, the dividends, the cash flows being produced are going to entice investors away from some of the more expensive stocks. Um, but uh, it's it's a sector that comes with risk. If you're scared about the recession, it's not a good time to buy oil. But in my view, the U.S. weathers the recessionary fears until something stocks the employment backdrop. Um, I do think we stay in a, a subdued, positive growth environment, and that's going to be very positive for energy stocks. Um, on the mining companies, we don't own any long. We're short a few in the store portfolio. Um, the supply-demand fundamentals across metals just aren't as compelling as they are for oil for me because you don't have an OPEC swing factor that's really artificially curtailed supply. So I, I prefer energy to mining right now. Right. What's your view, um, Edmund? Are, are these plays, or are they value plays or are they value traps? The oil companies? Well, both, um, both the mining and the sort of... The, I know you're positive on copper in particular and uranium, yeah, but, um, but but in terms of start, let's start with the oil plays, the likes of BP and Shell and Total yeah. and people like that. Well, I think, yeah, what I would say is that sustainability plays a big role here and obviously a bigger role in Europe perhaps than in the US where the pressure is higher. So you have seen you know, companies like BP and Shell and Total pivoting more towards you know, sustainable energy. So taking the profits they make from oil and then reinvesting some of those into 
more renewable energies. Now, clearly, they've been penalized for that because, quite rightly, I think investors say, well, the return on investment on renewable energy is likely to be much lower than it is on oil. However, because of the ESG concerns and the, the push towards ESG, and you know, we at BNP are also part of that. You know, we, we, we definitely lean very much towards sustainable, a more sustainable future. Having said that, as Patrick had said, you know, oil demand continues to grow. So let's we also have to be somewhat realistic here that oil demand is not going down. Oil supply is somewhat constrained. OPEC in the short term are constraining, well, Saudi Arabia and Russia principally. But the rest of OPEC are also struggling to even meet the current quotas. Forget the quota cuts. They can't meet the quotas as they are today. Um, just aren't making it. They're about a million barrels a day short. So instead of producing 36 million barrels a day, they're actually producing more than like 35 in a bit. Um, and on top of that, we have to remember, again, the other element of the supply side is the US, which of course has become a huge mm. producer. But shale oil production has actually been on the decline three months in a row. I thought so, it was a peak production, actually. Yeah, so the problem is the US can't pick up the slack because they're having their own problems. And what you're finding, interestingly, with new uh, shale oil wells being drilled is that actually they're producing a lot more gas. So the balance between oil and gas is much more gas and a lot, more, a lot less oil. So particularly, you know, when you think about oil, forget the gas, because really, there's plenty of gas in the US. But if you think about the oil, they're not producing as much as they used to, right? They're not putting in place lots and lots of rigs to drill lots of holes in the ground to find more oil. Um, so rig count is actually not very high. So all of that means to me that if oil demand on the one hand is going up and oil supply remain, con remain constrained and OPEC plus, particularly Saudi Arabia and Russia, don't do much about that to, to increase where they are in terms of production, I think, yeah, oil stays at easily at 95 on Brent. Probably doesn't go much higher, as Patrick said. I would agree with that. Um, but I think I think they're very comfortable. It's, they're extremely profitable at 95. Everyone's happy at 95, 90 to 95. And on top of that, the integrated oil companies benefit from a second tailwind, which, of course, is refining margins mm. remain well above historic averages. So, again, we are seeing squeeze on, for instance, diesel supply. Um, and so, and you need diesel not just for, obviously, cars, but think about heavy transportation, lorries, logistics, ships, and you know the list goes on. You you need a lot of diesel. And by the way, they'll also be competing with heating oil demand in the US as we come into the winter yet again. So all of that suggests to me refining margins stay high. Integrated oil companies should therefore remain extremely profitable. And as we said, dividends, share buybacks, well-supported, and probably continued debt repayment. So on a sort of shareholder return basis, they do look at it very attractive at the moment and at low valuation and there's a big valuation gap by the way between integrated oil companies in europe versus the us versus the names such as exxon mobil and chevron texaco mm. you know these okay. things trade 11 times europe more like seven times mm. so there is maybe a bit of a you know there could be a bit of a, a valuation catch-up as well yeah and they pay shed loads of dividends don't they exactly yeah now now chris in terms of sort of like if, if we do going to get sort of a firm oil price going forward how does that translate into inflation which has been coming down quite rapidly but inflation going forward and also the the sort of the context of federal the the um, central banks reducing interest rates the assumption that they're going to do that for next year and then also sort of like just top level how it sort of like what, what, if interest rates stay higher for longer what that means for bank balance sheets because uh they, that was that was the epicenter of the, of the problem at the start of sort of march april time uh, yeah, ton of, ton of very good questions. I mean, clearly, if if if, um, if the oil price stays high and goes higher from here, it starts feeding into inflation, absolutely, and often tends to feed into inflation expectations. There's normally a very good correlation between sort of one and I think one and three year inflation expectations and the oil price and or implied inflation within the bond market. In fact, that correlation unusually is broken down in the last few months, but it, you would have thought it might reassert itself. So, yeah, I mean, that would that would be a concern. Powell and Lagarde, they're all keen to stay high for longer. It's higher for longer is kind of the mantra now. Uh, personally, I don't believe it. I think what, what the oil price will do is just squeeze the economy, squeeze the consumer and add to the recessionary dynamic that we see brewing in the system. So I don't think oil price is going to stay up here for that long. I think um, I'd look to buy oil at 70 again. I suspect we'll get a retest of that level. That was a big level on Brent, 70, 71, from which we've rallied pretty hard. Um, but, you know, 
I accept I may be wrong. Oil is often a late cycle play, which is, I think, what we've essentially all been alluding to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we remember 2008 with the oil price rallying into the middle of 08. I think, I can't remember, we've got 130, 140, something like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, high oil price, if it happens, means higher for longer, means more pressure on banks' balance sheets, as you say. If you look at the US mid-tier banking system, I mean, basically, if you think of a, a normal regional bank, is essentially it takes deposits, makes loans and buys government debt and MBS and things like that. And it's under pressure on every area of its balance sheet because interest rates are too high. So if you leave them up there for even longer, it's a real challenge. I was looking at some of the monetary metrics this morning. Money supply is contracting pretty much everywhere in the West, pretty much in every measure of money supply that you can find. And that is not a good sign for the economy over the next six to 12 months. It's also another good way of explaining why a high oil price actually, instead of being inflationary, when there's no money being created, is more likely to be deflationary uh, because it'll bite on the consumer's spending power. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I agree with everyone that oil, oil sector is attractive on a two to five year view. I just think you've got to get through the recession and the response of the oil price to that recession first. Uh, but yeah, high oil prices, it's not good news, really. Yeah. Yeah, high high well, high prices are a, are a good solution, aren't they, for uh, high prices, as everybody says. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's commodity right. and oil. <laughs> now, now, yeah. Patrick, in terms of what's your sort of view on the banks? I mean, are we going to start seeing some of the um, the sort of the merchant banks benefited, the likes of BMP and Goldman's and people like that, given that the IPO cycle may be coming back with uh, with um, with with the success last week of uh, of Arm and a few others coming onto the uh, onto the onto the 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 the, 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 the market. Perhaps. And the trading revenues is a bigger swing factor for them. And those are h- harder to predict. Um, if, if you like banks, I just am attracted to the bonds that yeah. uh, the banks are cheap. They're paying dividends. I don't know if they're going to get cheaper, but the bonds I'm just so comfortable with. So for me, the way to play banks, I don't think there's massive upside. You're probably targeting the yield and the value and uh, you're going to get very similar returns from the bond with almost no risk. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm skewed towards the short end on uh in your investment grade. And, you, uh, and you're going into sort of ultra high grade to stick in with the JP Morgans of this world. Yeah, so senior uh, unsubordinated debt is where I'm going. Nothing too uh, sexy. I actually own some Cocos as well at the fringes. Um, but uh, which, yeah, which also, banks? I'm amazed after uh, Credit Suisse. I own just an ETF. I've got a wisdom oh, okay. three Coco 81 ETF, so diversified. But uh, you get a, a yield premium there, but uh, that comes with risk, obviously, whereas the, the short end senior, I don't think there is any risk. Right. What about you, um, uh, Edmund, in terms of bonds and fixed income? Where are you sort of like looking at? Are you looking at short or long or sovereign or corporate? Yeah, or um, short, to, or short to medium grade? term. There's no need to go long term. sovereign. I mean, the only time you go long term sovereign really is if you think there's a deep recession coming. We don't. We think there's a recession coming in the US, but not a deep one, pretty shallow one. So that's not really going to do huge damage. This huge damage that, that would want you to be going very long uh, long dated bonds. So short to medium maturity, more investment grade corporate than sovereign, to be honest with you, although we do like US tips. So we agree with, uh, I certainly would agree with Patrick, I like the inflation protection element, because it's a good each way bet, right? If we're wrong, and inflation does rear its head again, then you're okay, right? If we're, if we're right, and you know, Chris is right, and it comes down, you're still pretty okay, actually, because inflation probably isn't going to settle at two. It'll settle, settle probably at something over two. You pick up two real yield plus the two plus on the inflation means you get four and a bit on a on a sovereign. That's not too bad. And you get a bit of a pickup if you play corporates as well. So you can get up to nearly near a six in dollars on IG corporate. And then even on things like agency bonds in the US, which are like light government, but not quite government, you're actually getting quite a useful spread, which you and if you look at those indices of agency bonds, you can get over five percent in dollars, mm. and that's even without going as far as corporate. So there are plenty of places to find yield. I would agree with Patrick. I like bank bonds as well, um, and you don't need to go long duration; you could stay short duration. You can pick that up too. So there are, you know, we are basically in an environment which we haven't seen for ten to fifteen years, depending which market you look at. You know, whether you look at UK gilts or you look at corporate bonds or you look at bank bonds or agency bonds we just have not seen this level of yield for 10 to 15 years pretty much across the board the biggest challenge is just to persuade people to get out of cash and move into the bonds to lock in those yields because 
you know, the reality is that if we're right and there's a bit of a recession coming, uh, at, at the very least, activity is going to slow down a lot. At some point next year, central banks will be wanting to cut rates, probably. Now, if they cut rates, then, yeah, it's great if you're in cash. But remember, those cash yields will start to fall. Right. Whereas if you buy your if you buy into bonds now, you can fix that. Mm. So uh, yeah, we're big. Comp- we're, we're big. Um, we really like fixing those yields now. Yeah. Because at some point next year, cash rates will start to fall. And then mm. yeah, your deposits will not be as valuable as they are now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting, actually, because you do get the optionality benefit of, of holding cash. I mean, it's people like, you know, sort of like punters like me, we, we go, we've gone stocks. Well, I've, gone, I've got about 30% now in, in, in cash, but no bonds, simply because it gives me that chance that when interest rates do come down, I can then move it quickly without the transaction costs of bonds. But uh, yeah, and no, I can absolutely understand. Uh, but no, but that, ma- but that makes sense for a dynamic investor like yourself, who's fairly active. Um so for an active investor, absolutely, the choice is going to be more between mm-hmm. cash and stocks. But for, let's say, someone at retirement or someone who's looking for a steady income and doesn't want to be thinking too much about it and, and is not active, different. it's a completely different conversation. Yeah, yeah. Now we're just turning again, or you know, pivoting to the consumer here, Chris. What's your sort of latest here? Because we do... We've had the U.S. Um, earnings season. And one thing which did come out was that the majority of the sort of the the media, the medium type sort of retailers disappointed. They were either hit by sort of like, you know, contracting margins or shrinkage. And it seems as though, but what, what's your latest view? Because if you if split it between the high end, the medium end and the low end of consumers around the world. Yeah, well, it's a stimulus cliff. You know, we're at the stimulus cliff, basically. And um, the cliff hits different time for different quartiles of, of, of income. So, uh, you know, all that chat about excess savings in the US, we got up to 1.8 trillion in, I think, uh, late 2020, early 2021. And if you look at the calculations of where we are now, we, we sort of do some fancy calculations and, and you end up with it's basically running out about now. And then you, then you split it by income um, quartile, as you mentioned, we've had quite a lot of retailers struggling in, in August. Uh, we had the low income retail struggling earlier this year. Dollar Generals and the like. And um, we've even had some of the luxury good makers talk about the US being a bit tough. So, I, I, you know, I think um, the late market's tightening up, uh, you know, around the world. The excess savings are basically run down. If you look at core household bank deposits in the US, they're below pre-pandemic trend relative to GDP. So there's lots of reasons, I think, to to say, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's actually it's starting to look a little bit tougher out there. I know there are one or two bright spots and people point to them. Um, but but yeah, I mean, just just look at the amount of lending, the amount of borrowing that's going on in this economy. It's essentially zero in, in on the cons- on the consumer side. Eurozone, Eurozone household borrowing is negative uh, year on year growth. US mortgage applications for purchases of new homes is at a 27 year low. U- UK mortgage lending, uh, net mortgage lending is just above zero and has been below zero in the last couple of months. So, so, the, so the consumer is is running out of road. We're we're hitting the cliff, and uh, it's going to be quite interesting six months. Mm. How are you playing the consumer, Patrick? Are you staying at the high end or you, you avoiding the low end? How how, how how do you see it? Um, we've consumer stocks. We've got we own Amazon. So the mega cap one, um, yeah. that's a, a retailer. We own Hermes still. Um, we sold LVMH earlier in the year. And we have Stellantis, um, which is a Animal health. stock. Um, so uh, we, we're pretty much neutral in line with the benchmark. So we've, we've got three stocks out of a 30-stock portfolio. It's probably about 10% of my portfolio and those consumer-exposed stocks. Um, Stellantis is up probably 40% year-to-date, and it's at five times earnings. Mm. Amazon's up 40% year to date and it's at 50 times earnings. I don't know which one I'd rather own here out of the two. I can see uh, Stellantis suffering, but I can also see the multiple Amazons uh, suffering from a day. Amazon hasn't cleaned up a monopoly position, but I think they have a monopoly position in profitable online retail right now almost, that all of its competitors are still not at that profit-making point, whereas Amazon has moved to making profits in the uh, the retailing part of its business. So cloud is still the engine for profitability, but on the retailing side of things, it is getting profitable now as well. Mm. And just on that Stellantis, how do you see the um, the, you know, the the UAW strike out in the States panning through on the sort of the, 
the the, the OEM manufacturers. And likewise, the one area that a lot of people have sort of been scratching their head is how much exposure they have to auto loans. Do they still have that on their balance sheets, or have they um, have they shifted it off? No, they still have it, and I think it's actually going to be a big issue for all companies is uh, wage costs, labor costs, unionization. Um, it's a thing that profit margins are still near record high across the board. And um, wage inflation, I think, is going to prove to be sticky. Um, it's still a relatively tight labor market. Um, it's not maybe as tight as it was, but I think job seekers still have some pricing power. Um, unions have power in this environment, and I think it is going to cut into profit. So it is something to keep an eye on, and I don't think it's just going to be an auto thing. I think uh, wage costs and lower profit margins are going to be an issue for equities potentially. Right. Okay. And then Edmund, in terms of sort of broader, you know, investment themes you're looking at going forward, obviously you've you're, sort of, you're still relatively positive, but but going to fixed, you know, fixed income. Is there any sort of like on the you know, the secular growth you you think are trading at reasonable sort of like multiples that people should have a good look at? Well, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there are, you know, the flip side of so much money going into the big seven mega caps in the US, you know, and that's on a global, global scale. You know, we have Asian clients who do, who've been doing that and are very overweight and Middle Eastern clients. And my, my challenge is to try to get them to diversify these portfolios out of these, what have been very big winners for them. Um, but the flip side of all of that sort of um, the sort of magnet of attraction of the mega cap stocks is that a lot of other stocks, and a lot of other segments have been completely and utterly ignored, even within the stock market. I mean, if you look at mid and small caps, for instance, I mean, I only have to say UK small caps as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, there's good and bad in there, but no one they give cares. me a nightmare. Edmund. Just nobody cares, it seems. And there are some very good companies in there, but nobody cares. You know, it's 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 like that at the moment. I mean. Uh, again, Japan, Japan's getting some traction and, you know, everyone keeps telling me, ah, oh, but it's gone so far already. But yeah, look at a 30 year chart. It did nothing for so you know, for mm -hmm. more than a couple of decades. And yeah, finally, it's doing something, but for good reason. Um, and still Japan and the problem with Japan for at least a European or a US based investors, if you didn't currency hedge, at least half of what you gained on the on the stocks and local in the yen, you then lost on the yen itself because, of course, the yen has been depreciating. Um, so that's been rather fr unless you were clever enough to buy an ETF that was currency hedged to avoid that uh, drag. You've actually not benefited from from the Japanese run up as much as you as much as you know Mrs. Watanabe would have, for instance. So, yeah, you know. There, there's still that, and I still there. There is that to play for as well. I think there is more to go in Japan. I think it is an interesting indirect way if you do want to play China. For me, oil demand is the one way, or Japan is another another way to play indirectly China without buying Chinese stocks. Um, but you know the the profit improvements that we are seeing across a whole swathe of industries in Japan for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, partly through government pressure, partly through activist pressure. Who you know, but. They're pointing the same way. Profitability is structurally going up. Returns to shareholders in terms of dividends and buybacks are going up. And that's that's actually, and, and probably the profit estimates are probably still a bit understated, if anything, for Japanese companies, because analysts are really bad at forecasting, uh, forecasting their profits. They basically just follow company guidance, and Japanese company guidance is famously extremely conservative. Mm. So again... It could be that the Japanese stocks are a bit cheaper than you think because the estimates are still a bit sort of a bit too conservative. Good. What about you, um, Chris? Where are you sort of the broad sort of opportunities are in sort of sectors and uh, maybe countries or whatever? Well, it kind of depends on your time frame, but I'd say in the short term, uh, the defensive, some of the defensive sectors are really cheap. And so that's a place to put some money, particularly the if you utilities think you're talking about. And well, I'm more thinking of staples, actually. Staples globally is, is about as, almost as cheap as it ever gets relative to the market um, uh, across the globe. So uh, that sort of area, <clears throat> if you're thinking on a sort of one to two year basis, there is, I, I'm, I'm with Edward, there is tons of opportunity. And the quicker we get into this recession, the quicker that opportunity is, is to be pounced on. Um, I, you know, I was in Scandinavia last week talking to a, a mid cap fund manager who's telling me that the underperformance of Scandinavian mid caps relative to big caps is about as wide as it's ever been in the last year or two, which is a classic sign that you're late cycle. Um, 
And, and that's everywhere. I mean, uh, you know, you, you can draw, we have this curve we draw of sort of 10,000 global stocks and you, you organize it by PE ratios and draw a distribution curve. And the distribution curve is massively shifted to the left which is basically telling you pretty much every stock is cheap if you believe the consensus earnings. So get into the recession, uh, get through the defensive phase, and then the, it's going to be rich pickings. And the pickings are not going to be tech. They're going to be every, almost everything else, mm. uh, from small mid-cap to cyclicals to energy to big-cap banks. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And if, you, if you're right there, Chris, you're going to see a big reset on EPS expectations, the S&P 500 for next year, because it's been trending up over the last month and a half. And I think it's about, what, 245, 6, 7, something like that at the moment. And that's a 10% increase on this year's expectations. That's going to be a major shock to a lot, yeah. of, a lot of investors, if you're right. Yeah, and look, I mean, S and P consensus earnings basically follows what bond yields do. So, you know, bond yields have been moving higher. The data has been a bit better in the states. The sort of immediate data, and that, of course, is getting everyone excited about this soft landing debate. But if I'm right and we're going to get a recession, bond yields are going to be considerably lower, and so are the earnings estimate. But, but, um, but in the U.S., of course, you've got this dominance of 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 those big cap tech that sort of distorts everything and if you looked in other regions of the world europe's been a bit better the rest of it hasn't really so um it's a mixed bag globally and the us i think is just benefiting from a softer dollar the first six months of this year and uh, and a bit of a stronger economy and yeah. as i said they're coming to the the stimulus cliff which has got to be the next big buzzword stimulus cliff let's get that into the mindset <clears throat> we have got we have got general election in the UK probably late next year, and we have one obviously in November out in the states. So that may be a bit more extra stimulus. I can't see Biden wanting to have a reset, sort of choking off the economy. Well, he, he won't get anything through Congress now. It's he won't. Yeah. Then nothing will go through in the next twelve months of, of, to that size, unless there's a proper recession. Yeah. What about you, um, Patrick? In terms <clears> of sort of broad themes and how you're viewing it, in terms of where you're putting your money for the next twelve to twelve to eighteen month um, view. Um. So our view is things are pretty appropriately priced. Equities very slightly expensive. Bond yields probably get enticing me enough that they're fair value now too. Um, the U.S. I do think continues to run a fiscal deficit without the new spending. That Infrastructure Act, all the spending's being pre-agreed. That uh, that's going to keep the U.S. running at a deficit. So that that's going to continue to be a fiscal thrust. Um, I don't think the Fed's going to upset the apple cart and provoke um, a spike up in an unemployment, which would cause the mm. recession. So I think the Fed's sitting on their hands now for the foreseeable future. BOE's got one more hike ahead of them. So it's um, not something where I'm pounding the table that something looks incredibly attractive or something looks ridiculously overexpensive. Um, I like the oil. I like the healthcare because they've been laggards. The mega cap techs that are expensive, I'm still cautiously bullish on that. I, I'd sell the put options out the, on them and own them if they got a little bit cheaper. So it's that kind of environment where you can eke out 7 to 12% returns without taking a lot of risk. Um, and if you want to take no risk at all, you get the 6% for free right now. So I, I think that's actually a pretty reasonable backdrop for investors right now. Okay, good. And then just finally, then just going around the table in terms of things to watch, um, Edmund, Anything there that we, we we should look out for? I mean, is there going to be a sort of major reset in the in the housing market at all? Because we've got UK prices going down, you mm. know, year on year at the moment. Or uh, the states has been pretty resilient, but I'm guessing European house prices, particularly out in Germany, are pretty toppy as well. <laughs> well, they've been falling. I mean, quite clearly they've been yeah. falling. You know, you could basically just draw uh, an inverse correlation between the rising cost of financing and the and of course falling house prices because yeah guess what mortgage rates go up you can't afford as much and that's the same in whether it's in the US Germany UK it doesn't matter where now you know there's always a delayed reaction in the property market because there's always this gap that appears between buyers and sellers because psychologically buyers aren't willing to pay the price they know the market's falling and of course sellers 
are sort of unwilling to accept the reality that prices are falling. Mm. And they think, yeah, other prices may be falling, but I don't want my price to fall. And and so it always takes six to 12 months for the two to become more closely aligned for basically the sellers to accept reality. It's just like, you know, they have to suffer the, the long drawn out pain, you know, death by a thousand cuts before they finally accept the reality and drop their prices. And then we're sort of getting there. But there are some very strange things going on because let's not forget that rental demand, on the other hand, is still incredibly strong. If you look in London, if I look in Paris, or I look in the US, you know, rents are very robust. And I know my kids have been looking for, a, you know, places to rent in London. And it's extremely difficult. So again, this is, this is also partly due to the change in regulations around buy to let and then, of course, the tax implications, which have become a lot tougher in the UK. But you see this everywhere. You see this everywhere that rental markets on the residential side are extremely robust because, again, if people can't buy their first house, what do they do? They rent for longer. So the rental demand is very strong. So, look, there is this reset of prices. I don't think it's a collapse because, again, you need a deep recession for that. You need, more importantly, unemployment to be going up a lot. When unemployment mm. goes up, then then the housing market takes a massive hit. Again, you can think about the early 90s when we had sky high interest rates and, and unemployment rates that went up a lot in the UK. And that's that's the cocktail that um, that's property market can't stomach. But we're not there, I think. Okay. I think actually there'll be a recession in vacancies. I'm not so sure there'll be a big jump in unemployment rates because companies, maybe they don't want to hire more people but they seem quite content to hang on to their people mm. and just try to make do with what they, what they've got at the moment. Yeah, labour hoarding. What about mm. you, Chris? Any sort of like um, hidden ordinance at all in sort of private credit or the, um, I'm not sure, in, in sort of like PE world and in private equity that essentially if you've got higher rates for longer, then their balance sheets like some of the regional banks are also going to be pretty stretched. The dollar is fascinating, isn't it? The dollar is strengthening, but tells you that liquidity is tiny and generally there's a good chance that something might blow up. Mm. Uh, there's a long list of possible candidates predicting which it might be is incredibly hard. I have to say there is so much to keep an eye on at the moment. Uh, mm. You know, risks to our view, I think, are that maybe bond yields go to five. There's a big chat about that. And part of that equation could be the oil price moving higher. And then on, if you look at the flip side, it looks to me like the unemployment rate in the UK and the US is starting to properly move up. I think that'll be fascinating. If you look at UK employment, over the last three months, it's been steadily going down. The number mm. of people with jobs is going down. And the number of people unemployed in the UK and the US is going up. All the labour market indicators at the fringe are deteriorating. So I think, you know, watch the steepness of the yield curve, because yield curves steepen up into recessions. And that's what it tried to do in March, and the Fed offset it with their $400 billion of liquidity. Watch that yield curve. I think the tens twos is going to have a massive insight into what's going on in the global economy, what's going on in the US, and, uh, and, the, and, and the timing of moving into that recession. Because I think if we're right and there is one, the stock market has got to respond mm. and you're going to have a, 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 another leg down in, in, in a bear market. So, yeah, it's such an interesting time for a macro guy. Uh, so it's, pretty, it's, probably, it's pretty painful, it's, actually, at the at the coal face as a stock picker as well. So, Well, it is. Unless you're in seven stocks, most of the rest of the world is painful. Yeah. Um, or unless you're doing those cunning trades. I love, love that um Trey Patrick's doing on uh, Nvidia. I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. What, what What about you, Patrick? In terms of things to watch over the next um, sort of like you know few months that you're sort of like you know closely monitoring. Um, well, China is going to play a big factor. What they do, um, the stimulus they've done has been largely symbolic so far. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to write the economy, but uh, what they do, there's different ways they can do it. They've got some demographic issues. They've got unemployment issues. And the scary thing is war is an answer to some of those things potentially too even. So um, mm -hmm. I don't know how they go. I think that's going to be a big swing factor that's largely unpredictable. Um, going into the election years, I think that's going to provide a reasonable backdrop for the U.S. economy. So I, I don't think the U.S. economy falls into the recession. Recession is still plausible, obviously, but I actually think the, the U.S. can just keep kicking the can down the road, growing subtrend, but maybe avoiding that recession. And I saw in the latest, there was a Citibank came out with their economic projections over the next two years. And they, they were saying that all the major areas were going to be going to miss or avoid a recession. Do you think that is actually possible? I mean, that's just like saying we haven't had a recession for 15 years yeah. and we're going to miss it again. And I mean, is that is that is that? Well, hang on, Paul. Hang on. That's not exactly true. 
the COVID pandemic was a recession. It was a very bizarre okay. recession. Ex- I, I and it was that, a deliberate it was five recession. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. You blinked, you blinked, and you missed it. But that still qualifies as a significant setback in economic activity. Yeah. So, what do you re- so, Patrick, are we going to avoid this? Are you, are I you think see- the US does. Europe and the UK are in such a precarious position already where there is no growth. Any hit basically does taunt that recession. But it was a year ago pretty much today that I said a soft landing was an impossibility. Um, I wrote a little LinkedIn article about the the Fed's got to choose inflation or recession. Um, It's going to be impossible to engineer this middle ground. And uh, circumstances have led to it where it's totally plausible now. Mm -hmm. Um, Europe... Again, um, I see scenarios where they can avoid it, but it could easily fall into it as well. Yeah. Well, it's a bit like, um, I think it's the, was it the three bears? It's safe to go down the woods today, potentially. <laughs> we'll find out anyway in the next few months. So uh, thanks very much, guys, for all your terrific comments and uh, look forward again in touching base uh, in about a month's time. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye.